Hi, everyone. This is September 15th, 2019, and it is episode 196 of At Percussion. This is Carly Vigna, and I'm here today with co-host Ben Charles. Hi, Hi Ben. And Casey Cangelosi. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Casey, I think you, you might have just walked in the door coming from the North Carolina Percussion Symposium. How was that? It was great. Yeah, thanks for asking. It was so good. And this is only their third year doing it. And they've had like a big guest artist every time. They had Shi Wu. They've had Michael Burrett. And yeah, just just very, very impressed with everything I saw and the students. And there was this kid there who was 14 years old. And during my clinic, we got into this cool conversation about avant-garde music and Comp composition just in general, but also, you know, really, really difficult, challenging music. It's really dissonant. And he knew Stravinsky. He knew Schoenberg. He knew, and this isn't me saying these names and him like nodding. No, he said these names. He said, so when I listen to composers like Schoenberg and that, that uh, you know, progressed into things like Fernie Howe, like he knew Fernie Howe. And I was like, wait a minute. I, I said in the clinic, how, how old are you? He's 14. I think I embarrassed him a little bit. I didn't mean to, but I was really, really impressed by just yeah everything there and the other clinicians. And yeah, I don't know about you all, when, but when you go to these things, do you, do you try to see as many other clinicians as possible? Do you like, 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 I know some people are, they just don't have the bandwidth for it. They're maybe a little burnt out or something, which I can totally understand. I've been there, but I, I learn a lot. Like I know generally you agree with what the other clinicians say, but I just learn a lot by, I pick up quotes, especially, you know, I feel like, okay, that's a, an opinion I agree with, but they said it better than I ever could. And now I get to tell my students like, Hey, this doesn't just come from me. This comes from the Phantom Regiment tech, you know? Um, so they, it just adds more weight to your opinion, you know? Yes, I totally agree. And like, it, I remember I did one a couple years ago in Illinois and like Gwen Deese was one of the uh, clinicians. So that was a spectacular experience. Casey, who puts that on? Who does the North Carolina one? It's it's not, is it their PAS chapter? So it's not. So in fact, I pulled it up because I wanted to just thank them. But uh, Kuntal Shah was one of the hosts and he teaches at this Enol High School in Green and Green Hope High School and actually a JMU alum, which might have been why he reached out to me first. But Casey Segola Slump is, uh, excuse me, Casey Segola Slump is uh, one of the other hosts that teaches there. So yeah, just, just, they're just the, the drumline instructors there. You know, they are the percussion instructors there. They managed to put this whole thing together. And 120 kids were there this time. Wow. Yeah. Was it a, a multi-day event or one day? One day, yeah, but a full day. Yeah, winner's yeah. concert, competition, uh, yeah, clinics all day. There's little breakout sessions, little 30-minute timed rotations where I was in a, a room with Nathan Daughtry and myself talking about composition. Students would come in and ask questions about composition or publishing or whatever. And, yeah, I was, I was yeah, really impressed. That's so cool. That's great to hear. Um, our guest today is Dr. Yunju Alice Pan. She currently serves as an adjunct professor at University of North Alabama uh, alongside our friend Tracy Wiggins. Alice is an award-winning performer and educator who has performed with Jew Percussion Group, uh, with Gordon Stout, with Gwen Deese, and many, many more. She won the 2016 Australia Marimba Competition and also the 2016 Taiwan International Percussion Championship in Marimba, Vibraphone, and Chamber Ensemble. It's so great to have you with us today, Alice. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me here. Oh, welcome. So I, I know you just recently relocated, right? Right. Two weeks how, ago. <laughs> well, <laughs> how are you settling in in, in Alabama there? Um, it's getting better. I moved into an apartment a couple of days ago. Now I have a bed and I have a house to live in, which is nice. <laughs> that makes a big difference. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty frustrated to just live in the hotel. Well, yeah, I can imagine, especially long term. Um, so how's, how's the position going? Are you settled into the school year and the semester? Yeah, um, it's going well. I had, um, I have two weeks, yeah, two weeks of teaching, and um, everything's went pretty smooth so far. That's good. Good. What are what are your responsibilities there this semester? Um, this semester I mainly teach 
um, lesson keyboard lessons. Um, I do have a couple of students that's having four hour lesson with me that I have to teach not only keyboard but also um, all the percussions. And from next semester, I'm going to have my own percussion ensemble and then um, building a percussion ensemble program. Cool. So when students study with you, are they seeing you every week to work on marimba, or do they kind of rotate through? Yeah, they see me every week for, um, most of them for a half hour. Oh, okay. There are a couple that's one hour. <laughs> nice. Well, I'm, I'm happy for you with the new position. It sounds very good. Thank you. Um, you know, I wanted to tell everybody, I first, I first met Alice at the McCormick Marimba Festival in person. I think we knew each other on Facebook before that. Um, and it was back in January, and I remember she played a, a beautiful solo recital. And I'm so happy that I was able to hear it, because it was one of those things, like Casey was saying, like, you perform, you, and then you just try to watch as, as much of everything else happening as you can. I think you were... You were not long after me and, and my students, um, but yeah. one of the one of the pieces that I've been thinking about since I heard you play it that I, it keeps coming back was um, the Ox Suite, three songs for a singing marimbas by Josh Oxford. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that piece. Yeah, um, so this piece, Josh Oxford is my friend from Ithaca College where I did a master degree, and um, he was a percussionist, and then he had some. Uh, accident and he can't play so he transferred to composition um so one day he just listened to me singing and decided to write something for marimba and singing and at first it's only the first movement which is called afterwards um and after the premiere of that one and he decided to write another two songs to make it a suit so were you doing a lot of singing while playing marimba before that? Is that something that developed kind of naturally for you? No, that's the first piece that I did. Um, oh. I do like singing a lot. I actually took one year off from um, uh, after bachelor degree to master degree to sing in the pub. So, um, and then after I go to the Ithaca College, um, he, we met and we decided to do these kind of things. So that's my first piece. Wow, cool. Mm -hmm. And have, have you done others since then? Um, yeah. I transcribed some pop song that my friend wrote from Taiwan. And I'm also, there's going to be more coming up soon. <laughs> cool, I look forward to hearing about it. Uh, Casey, I think you have something. I was gonna go ask uh, back to your, your job there with our buddy Tracy Williams. And I think it's, it's not too mysterious how people get full-time professor jobs. There's a job posting, you apply for the posting, you submit your stuff, there's rounds, interviews, etc. But a lot of times adjunct positions are, in a, in a way, harder, well, they're more mysterious how you get them. And because sometimes they do a job announcement, sometimes they don't. Sometimes you can just you, you can just kind of choose who you hire. The the rules are very different. A lot of times someone won't move to a town. You said you moved. This is why I thought of this. You you moved to this this new place for this job, and a lot of times they'll just hire someone who's close by. There's there's, all, there's kind of a whole you know gray area with how that works. So the connection <laughs> is super important. Um, I, I did a performance and clinic two or three years ago at UNA, and then after that, um, I keep in touch with Dr. Wiggins, and this summer, he just called me and asked me if I'm interested in um, doing this. So at that time, I was just graduated, and I have nothing to do trying to find a job. So I immediately said, yeah, I'll do that and I'll move there and see what's happening next. So, so did he kind of put out, a, a tell everyone he, there was a need and then you responded or did he come straight to you first? How did that like initial well, conversation he, Um, He comes straight to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what about, what about Ben and Carly? Mine was luck. <laughs> yeah, uh, so. and this is, geez, this is Boko Raton, right? Yeah, well, it's kind of, kind of that uh, that saying was that luck is when opportunity meets preparation. 
Um, when I was going to Miami, um, there was another school, Florida Atlantic University, about an hour north, that had another Miami grad student that had been teaching there. His name was Cliff Sutton, and he won a Fulbright scholarship to go study in Latin America. And so Cliff left, and uh, the band director there called up my teacher, Svet, at Miami and said, I need a person. Who do you have? Uh, and Carly had already gotten the TA spot at Miami, and I didn't have a TA. So <laughs> um, okay, good for Carly. Um, but yeah, and so Svet said, well, I've got this guy that doesn't have a teaching assistantship and could sort of use one. So it was sort of an unofficial teaching assistantship um, for me. And it was kind of cool because I actually got to keep it when I graduated, which a lot of people get these teaching assistantships. Then obviously when you graduate, you you lose it. So um, yeah, it actually worked out well in my favor to not get the teaching assistantship in a way. Yeah, a job is better than a, a deal at school probably, right? Yeah. Yeah, probably so. In the long yeah, run, yeah. 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 yeah, you know, my, my situation, my first adjunct position was at FIU, and it's really similar, I think, to what, what Alice's experience was, that I had contacts there, and they reached out to me and said, hey, would you like to join our faculty? And I said, now that's exactly the direction I want to go. Um, I think it ranges a lot. I've um, At New World School of the Arts, which is a school that I just started at, um, this fall, which I'm thrilled about, I actually went and had an interview and played an audition. Like I played a short solo recital. I taught the students. I had a demonstration, um, and that's you know a similar similar number of hours, but just structured differently. Um, so I, I think it varies a lot. Sometimes they post, sometimes they don't. Cool. Well, Alice, as a follow up to that, uh, I had a question for you and many of us. I certainly Carly and me are teaching at schools where the I am the percussion department. I'm the <laughs> the only one. <laughs> Faculty meetings for the percussion department are very easy. Um, <laughs> but uh, when you're team teaching, which I know Casey does at JMU with Caleb and Alice, obviously with Tracy at UNA, um, what how how do you divide up the team teaching? Especially, uh, I don't know Tracy's playing very well, but I can imagine that just based on your training, Alice and Tracy are very different players. Um, and in my experience, like North Texas, where I did my undergrad, all the teachers have a very similar philosophy. I mean, Mark Ford and Christopher Dean go way, way, way back. So I never found any conflicting information between lessons. So how do you reconcile those differences? Um, at UNA, um, we actually have more percussion instructors, um, and some of them I haven't even seen it yet. Um, but mostly Tracy decides, Tracy organized everything. And um, my responsibility is mainly in keyboard playing. And there's another adjunct that's teaching younger, like freshmen and sophomore. <laughs> and there's, I think, a drum set instructor and a world percussion instructor. So all of us has a different um, area, but we all report back to Tracy. He, he He's like very, Respectful for um, our teaching style. He didn't really like intrude, intr intrude it too much. Yeah, he trusts you guys. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it's. I mean, it's one thing that's very nice is I know like if I was teaching with Carly or Casey, who I both know very well at this point, I know there are big differences between all of our playing. Uh, but I don't think anyone's right or wrong, and I would certainly be receptive to a student if a student picked. Carly's way of playing something on snare drum, I wouldn't be offended by that. <laughs> Have you ever team taught a student, like you and the other teacher together at the same time, working on the same piece? Uh, I, at I the same heard. time? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 that's too much. Seems <laughs> like yeah. a good way to get your teachers to fight. <laughs> well, 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 so I was going to say, the, the, the best time I've ever had doing that, and the most comfortable I've ever been with another teacher is with Pius Chang, because when I visited his school, we just, he said, like, yeah, teach my lessons with me. And so I did for I, not too many lessons, like a couple lessons, but it was, yeah. You guys was, just make jokes the whole time? Well, that was the thing. <laughs> I think we taught a couple really good lessons, too. Like, it was really, yeah, it was really, it was really fun. Can we get those students on the podcast? See what they, yeah, see there. <laughs> you're only hearing, yeah, you're only hearing one side of the story. Oh, that was <laughs> terrible. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I was going to say, shoot, I was going to say something. Uh, oh, have you learned all Tracy's little nicknames, like Twiggy and 
maybe since he's Dr. Wiggins, Dwiggins, I don't know. I've heard all these things before. Gene Kaczynski tells me these things. <laughs> no, I never heard about that. Not yet? Okay, you Not can remember yet. that. Maybe soon. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Maybe come up with your own nicknames. Oh, yeah. You can tell us. We'll talk okay. about it on the podcast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll think about it. I'll let you know. <laughs> Well, it's, yeah, it sounds like the moral of the story here is that uh, a, a lot of these jobs just come from connections. And it's, of course, yeah, that's always such a, a, a big thing to, to talk about. We talk about like the, the big networking word and but networking doesn't matter if you aren't, you know, talented. Like Tracy wouldn't have reached out to Alice if he didn't know she could do the job and if he couldn't trust her and, and didn't really, you know, admire her playing and teaching and, and personality and all those things. So yes, networking, but also just confidence, you know. Well, and it goes back to like the thing that I'm sure we all heard a ton when we were students and that we share with our students is you never know who you're going to meet and make an impression on anywhere at any time. You know, it was a couple of years ago, you go and give a class and then in a few years it turns into something major, like you moved to Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's the perfect example, and I love seeing those because I love to tell my students, like, when you go to this festival, you want to be really prepared because you don't know who you're going to meet at that festival that in 10 years could be playing with the Met or could be, you know, have a really prominent chamber group. You never know. Right. So it's awesome. It's awesome to see. One of the one of the coolest stories like that I've ever heard is there was a, a trombone professor at Virginia Commonwealth University, which is in Richmond, where I grew up. And I was talking to him and he said, yeah, when I was in high school, I would go to these jazz camps and there was this, this guy named Winton that was just burning on trumpet, <laughs> which obviously turned out to be <laughs> Marsalis. But that, yeah, <laughs> never know. You, this you guy. Know Marsalis is, yeah. <laughs> well, Ben, I think you have something to share with us on Gordon Stout. Yeah, so since Alice is one of Gordon's students, I thought I'd, I'd give the book report on Gordon Stout and then we could ask Alice about studying with Gordon. Gordon was a previous podcast guest, which I should have written down his episode number off the top of my head. I don't know why I feel like it was 56, but I'm probably totally wrong on that. But you can find it on our new Podbean podcast site. <laughs> uh, but anyway, hey so the, the quick background on Gordon Stout. Uh, I wanted to give a side note. When I was um, doing my research for this on Gordon's website, I found an article uh, it was actually a transcript of a PASIC panel discussion called Rosewood One Last Breath that I think Gordon was the moderator for. Um, and like I said, it's a transcript, so you can see what everyone said. They had uh, Doug DeMauro, Mark Ford, Shi Yi Wu, um, I can't remember, Ron Samuels, and a few other people involved in marimba manufacturing. Um, fantastic stuff if you're interested in that Rosewood preservation topic that we've talked about a couple of times. Um, also, Fernanda Meza, I remember was in there. But anyway, so on to the, the Gordon Stout info here. Gordon was born in 1952 in Wichita, Kansas. Both of his parents were professional musicians. His father was a horn player and his mother was a flute player in the Kansas City Philharmonic. Gordon says he recalls listening to classical music on road trips as a kid, and he states that he learned all the Beethoven symphonies by ear before he even knew who Beethoven was. Uh, in uh, 1954, his family moved to Elmhurst, Illinois, where his father played in the Chicago Symphony for six years. Then after that, in 1960, his family moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan, where his father began his 28-year tenure as professor of French horn at the University of Michigan. His father took him all around the university uh, when he was about eight or nine years old and introduced him to all of the professors. And Gordon chose James Salmon and the marimba as his uh, preferred professor and instrument. And so he says, I chose Jim Salmon because he was a very nice man who was easy to be around. And I chose the marimba because the first time I hit a bar, I thought the sound was just incredible. He started composing for the marimba during his senior year of high school. He wrote two pieces, Reverie and Elegy, which I've heard of, I don't think I've ever actually heard either one performed, uh, as study pieces for the Fissinger Suite for Marimba, which is one of those early marimba works. Um, and then after he studied with Salmon for 10 years growing up, when he went to college, he decided it was time for a new chapter. So he decided to attend the Eastman School of Music, where he studied with John Beck. And he recalls learning by watching some older students, including a couple guys named Bill Kahn and Bob Becker, who would later become members of the percussion group Nexus. While at Eastman, he studied with Joseph Schwantner, excuse me, he studied composition with Joseph Schwantner, Samuel Adler, and Warren Benson. 
Um, interestingly, Stout had written a book of etudes, and the ninth one didn't really fit in the book. And so Warren Benson said, well, how about you take this one? It sounds kind of Mexican. Why don't you write another one like this and call it Two Mexican Dances? Um, and so the two Mexican dances are not at all authentic Mexican music. And in fact, Gordon didn't even mean for them to sound Mexican. That was Warren Benson's uh, doing. So he says Warren's to blame for that one. <laughs> he <laughs> finished at Eastman in 1976 with a bachelor's degree in percussion performance and a master's degree in composition. And he began his illustrious performance career at the first ever PASIC convention in 1976, where I know he played the first Mexican dance uh, I think, among other things, but Bill Mersch talked about people saw Gordon play this first Mexican dance and it just blew their minds how difficult it was, which by today's standards, obviously, it's not too bad. Um, he be began also around this time teaching at St. Mary's College in Maryland for three years before he moved to Ithaca College, where he taught for 38 years and served as the chair of the Performance Studies Department. Uh, I can't remember the exact dates on that, but that was toward the end of his career. He retired from Ithaca College in May 2019, and his former students include Dane Richeson, Tom Burritt, Michael Burritt, uh, Naoko Takata, Kevin Bobo, Valerie Naranjo, and of course, Alice, our guest today. He was involved in that 1986 NEA Commission concert with Lee Howard Stevens and William Mersch that we've discussed a couple times on the podcast. He was the jury. He was a jury member at the first and second Lee Howard Stevens International Marimba competitions in 1995 and 1998. He has over five dozen compositions to date. One of which called Basicata that I got to give the world premiere for, which was pretty cool. I went up to Ithaca, played that with my buddy Kate, um, and Gordon dedicated that piece to Kate and me. So I'm very, uh, very proud of that one. <laughs> But some of his other compositions include some standards in the percussion repertoire, especially the marimba repertoire, including two Mexican dances, rumble strips, sedimental structures, astral dance, and wood that sings, which is one of my favorite two mallet pieces ever for marimba, and I think it's way underplayed. He's appeared at over a dozen PASIC conventions. He has over 20 recording credits to his name as a performer or composer. One of those recordings is Dave Hall playing the two Mexican dances, which was used as the uh, episode closing music to the series Weeds, if you've ever seen that TV show. He now plays on a custom Demaro Marimba, and he has a new line of mallets coming soon. You can read about that on his website, which I didn't know about. Oh, he's been oh. to... What's that? Sorry, Casey. I was just okay. wowing. That's great. I didn't know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So he's worked with Doug DeMauro to develop these mallets. He's been described as the Rubenstein of all aspects of the marimba, which I think is one of the coolest quotes I've ever heard. And he was inducted into the PAS Hall of Fame in 2012. So a huge, huge figure in our field. And Alice, you were fortunate to study with Gordon at Ithaca during your master's degree, was it? Could you tell us about that? Because I, I visited Ithaca two or three times when my friend Kate was studying there and loved every second with Gordon. Oh, yeah. Um, so, well, my story was Gordon can be traced back to when I was 13, I think. Um, and he went to Taiwan and did a percussion summer camp. And I was the little girl there, play Libertango for him and hit the last chord wrong. So he basically just laughed the whole time. Um, but after that, uh, he gave me his email, and then we keep sending email to each other and talking about music. And when I about to graduate from undergrad, um, I asked him if I can audition there. So I did audition, and he really liked it. And um, after the one year that I took a break, um, he accepted me to the college. And while I studied there, um, I think the thing, the teaching style that Gordon had was really dif different from what I have been experienced in Taiwan. Because in, in Asia, um, when you learn from the teacher, it's kind of like a, a master um, teacher kind of style so you basically have to listen to everything that the teacher told you and you have to do it the way that your teacher wants so when i first moved into ithaca and had the first lesson with him i asked him so what do you think i should play this phrase and he said um well play like alice so that's the first thing and i was super confused because i'm like i don't know how i will play it because usually people tell me how to play it so that's um 
that's a big, huge difference. Um, and that's um, the thing that I learned a lot during the two years I was at IC. Yeah, and uh, I think it was in his PAS Hall of Fame write-up, uh, Kevin Bobo gave a very nice quote about Gordon helps every student find their own individual voice. It's not that sort of dictation of what you have to do. Yeah. Ben, by the way, that was episode 15, Carly and 15. I went no, down to off. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but it was like, wow, we, we had Gordon Stout that soon? That's that's. I'm very proud of us for yeah, getting, getting someone like Gordon well, that, that's and Alice, Alice mentioned uh, playing Libertango for for Gordon. One of the, it's cool to just to look back at history and see who was in the in the same room at the same time. The first uh, Lee Howard Stevens competition in 1995 was the one where Gordon said in the final round it was it was a free repertoire selection. You could play whatever you wanted, and there was this young French kid that got up and played these four pieces he wrote called the Four Rotations. And it blew everyone's mind. And of course, that was Eric Smoot, and we know who he is today. But back then, he was absolutely nobody. <laughs> um, and, and well, actually, that's not true. He was, I think, playing in the Paris Opera already, so maybe not not quite a fair statement. <laughs> um, but in the marimba world, he was unknown, I should say. Um, and Gordon certainly helps make Eric Smoot's career what it is today with that victory. So, Alice, you were saying a, a little bit about finding your voice and developing, you know, your your artistry. As an individual, can you talk a little bit about what that what that experience was like and how it developed in the the years that you were studying at Ithaca? Yeah. Um, so at first, of course, I don't know what to do, and I was pretty well. I was really struggled by what he said. And there's a short period of time I think Gordon Stout is not a good teacher because he didn't tell me what to do. Um, <sighs> but. <laughs> But um, after a while, I start to, well, he, um, in the first semester, he mentioned to make good sounds a lot. And by making sure that all the notes that you play, that's good sound, I kind of can feel how the music should go instead of just a lot of notes put in together. Um, so after that, I start, start to think how um, I want my music to be instead of how this music should be. Yeah, I mean, of course, that's such an important lesson, and we hear about that all the time, and finding your voice, and your teacher helping you have a voice and become a voice. And I know they talk, uh, and, and we talked about it fairly recently, but if you, if, you tell, if you tell someone something specific, like, you know, Ben, ben tells me, hey, I have, a I have trouble with stage fright what do you do to get over it? And I say, or what should I do to get over it? And of course, the natural response is to tell him what I do. But if he just does what I do, he may never actually discover the thing that he needs to make it work for him. So you have to be, you have to be really careful. Like self-discovery can be so, so valuable. So I think it's, it's tricky. Like just tell them exactly what to do. And a lot of times, I don't know if you guys feel like this, but in teaching, you know, sometimes I feel like, okay, hey, my dear student, you're doing everything right. Everything here is good. I don't have a lot to say. We have an hour and really you just need to like do this, 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 and this more. That's it. Like I don't want to overcomplicate what's going on because the truth is you just need to do that for a lot longer and, and make it more automatic, do it and, and get really, really, really comfortable with it. But I think what we often try to do is we say like, oh man, I'm the teacher, if I don't fill this hour with tons of little tidbits of information and get like really, really specific, this, then the students, or I'm not doing my job or the student's going to think I'm stupid, but really like what they might need is, is just some space. And in at least my percussion pedagogy class, what I try to do is talk about the role of the teacher and how you have to change to the coach. Because a coach in like an athletic uh, situation they're not always telling you how to do it or what to do they're just like drilling you so okay students doing everything right we got to keep working on this piece we have an hour left i'm just going to start drilling you and like asking you to do it over and over and you, you know i don't know if you guys ever ever feel that feel that way and i've seen it in a master class too you know so the student plays something really really well and you can almost see the clinician gets this feeling of like, crap, that was really good. And I don't know what to say. And if I don't say something brilliant, everyone's going to think I'm stupid. So they're like, they just like kind of say something, you know, or whatever. Or they, 
if the student played the phrase up, they tell them to play it down or whatever. Like they just like throw comments out when really they should probably just point out what was good about it. And they should probably ask, you know, prod the student for questions to be illuminating to the other audience members who are also players. You know what I mean? Yeah. So much good stuff. So Alice, my question for you is what of maybe of that style of teaching have you taken into your own teaching style and what, what have you incorporated? Yeah, um, so asking a lot of questions is the thing that I learned from Gordon because in our lesson, basically when we play for the first, I don't know, 10 minutes-ish, and then he just asks a lot of questions and but those questions are the things that's helping me try to figure out how I want the music to be and how I feel about the music and <clears throat> help me do my own interpretation. So um, I do ask a lot of questions and try. Um, I'm still trying because I think my background of study in Asia um, is still having me some, sometimes still having me like tell people what to do instead of letting them the freedom to do so. Um, so I'm still reminding myself to um, ask their question and help them to do what they want to do. I think there's, I mean, there's certainly a balance between, yes, it's, it's not a bad thing to copy the master, so to speak, at times and try and emulate their style. And then other times, yeah, you do your own thing. Um, but Alice, so you also studied with uh, Gwen Deese, who obviously comes from the uh, Robert Van Syce legacy, so to speak. Um, and so with both uh, Gwen and those sort of Van Syce pieces and Gordon and his own pieces, it's interesting because like there's such an established uh, performance practice actually for relatively new repertoire here as to how should Dances of Earth and Fire sound or how should two Mexican dances sound. Um, so like when you studied with these master teachers on quote unquote their repertoire, how did you find your own voice within those pieces? Well, I, um, when I think about that, I, when I'm learning a piece, I think about the composer a lot. Like what's their style, what's their personality, why they wrote the music like that. So um, I do learn from their playing. And if I know there's certain um, interpretation that they need it's going to be there but in this um i'll do some stuff in this box that's a little bit different um than other people does that make sense like um so like dynamic if it's forte and if gordon's forte is always not that loud um but in that range i'm going to do a little bit of adjustment um, to fit how I feel about the music, that kind of thing. Uh, let's see, Alice, one, one other thing we can ask you about, I think you've, you know, you've had some really great experiences with competitions. Can you talk a little bit about the, the preparation and the, the actual competing part of the process? Yeah, yeah. Um, so learning a, a lot of pieces and practice really hard, that's like the thing for competition. And um, for doing a competition, I learned to perform instead of trying to impress people um, during the competition. So I take competition as another performance instead of something different. So when I prepare for it, I, I learn the notes, I do all the um, interpretation, musical ideas that I want, and I also practice how um, it might feel like for to be on the stage in the competition and prepare for that. And um, during the competition, I just trying to enjoy the stage. Yeah. Do you find do you, do you find it hard to enjoy? Well, you probably don't because you win so many things. I, I wonder. I, I've heard of so many people who, because I I feel the same way. Like when I'm going to perform, I need to enjoy the environment behind it, speaking of stage fright, the thing I learned about myself is the, the way I feel really comfortable before getting on stage is try to joke with like the sound person or the stage crew or the other performers and just like try to really, I don't know, just try to really surround it with positive laughter and, and, and just like, you know, some kind of joy. But 
is there anything we can tell the people who just find that environment so intimidating? You know, maybe they got on an international flight for the first time ever, and it's it's terrifying, all these people from other countries, and you hear them warming up in the other rooms, and you're like, holy crap, this person's already playing that piece, and that person's already playing that piece, and they're just like frozen, terrified. You know, I don't know, any, any advice of hope for them? Yeah, so um, first of all, I also lose a lot before I win it. Yeah, um, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so entering a competition is not it's not just thinking I have to win it. Take it as a um, a learning ex uh, learning opportunity and experience for you to overcome <clears throat> all this kind of pressure. And um, when I did the Australia Marimba competition, I actually um, had the experience of listening to other people play in the room and freaking out. And I call um, Professor Dees Guan Dees, and she, she's the one who told me that you have already did so much, and you practiced, you sing through all the music, you do everything that you can do, and now you're there, another country, you just have to enjoy it. So mm -hmm. when I did that competition, I actually didn't think I would have a chance to win, even go get into the final round, actually. Um, so I just decided to do whatever I did um, in the practice room and then bring it on the stage. Right. What's uh, what's Australia like? I have been, but I want to hear what you what you think. Like. Uh, when I went there, so it, it was summer in the United States, but it was winter there, so it's pretty cold. And um, all I'm thinking about is going to the zoo, and there's super cute um, koalas. I really like them. Right. I want to. I want to bring one home, but yeah. I missed the zoo. We had a car going to the zoo, and it just it wasn't it wasn't convenient. But I everyone came back, and they said that was the best thing that we did here. And so like <laughs> so yeah, this, still it. This reminds me. Sorry, I just have to interject. Like a weird thing. A while back, I think I was on the. I want to say it was the Black Swamp website, and they have a collaboration with some Australian company. And they are making tambourines with kangaroo skin heads. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and wow. apparently, wow. like they like it almost sounds like a joke. Like you're killing like the national animal, but uh, there it's it's a it's like a population control thing. Like they have to kill a certain amount of kangaroos, wow. and it's wasteful to not use their meat and not use their skin. So it's actually very sustainable. But so, yeah, it was just I just I was like what I was just like what am I reading? <laughs> it's so weird. <laughs> But I'm glad you said that because we ate we ate kangaroo we grilled kangaroo meat while we were there and one of the Australian students said yeah kangaroos are like rats here like they're dangerous they're everywhere and they're they're like pests you know they're like they're like vermin you know I was really surprised to hear that wow we oh, think wow. so is kangaroo meat it's good it's like really it's like really soft beef you know. I should get some of it. Cook it my sous vide for my next guest artist. You should. Yeah. <laughs> ben does this weird, weird. It's so, it's so weird. It's good. It's good though. Yeah, I think you. Right. Got, I think you. I think you got Caleb into it. He mentioned nice. it a few weeks ago. Said that's his next. Nice uh, interest. Yeah, but sorry, that was way off topic. <laughs> yeah, we got way off. We Go got on. <laughs> Yeah, way off the rail. Carly, you're the host. This is your responsibility. Well, so, speaking... Alice, when you were in Australia, how many kangaroos did you kill? <laughs> <laughs> I saw you just try, Carly. I heard you try to kill. I made a good effort. <laughs> a good effort back on the rail. Let's bring yeah. us back. So speaking of competitions, one thing that, that came to mind was what what's in your thought process? Aside from let's enjoy the music and enjoy the performance, do you find it difficult not to think about who you're competing against or, or rankings or anything like that. Um, and I, I assume what your goal is, is let's focus on exactly, like, let's enjoy this, let's make it as musical as possible. Um, yeah, I do, I do care about who my competitors are, so I just don't look, like, I didn't do any research of all, like, any of them, and I didn't do research of the panel, I didn't do research of anything i just go there and then see what's going to happen i think that's smart 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. It's a little bit coward, but it's... No, that's, I don't know. I think that's smart. I know people will say, like, you really need to research the, like, the committee or the panel and try to really get inside their, you know, like, their heads and everything and really figure out what they want to hear, but... I, that, that might be one thing if you're playing for like one person. I just don't even see that as practical with, cause what, what, what do they have, three judges, three or four judges? Well, and I mean, any any good judge is going to know that, the, like Robert Van Sice understands there are different good interpretations. Yeah. I don't think that yeah anyone, anyone worth being judged by would be, oh, you can't play that piece that way. <laughs> well, I'm just... Right. I mean, you guys know I've judged a handful of these things, like local and international ones, and like I was the judges I'm always with. I mean, we're always so different. Like we're totally different. And it still means we can come together and figure it out. But if a player tried to do, if a player tried to play a piece a certain way to like appease any one of us, it would have been canceled out by like like that appeasement either would have been negative for the other person or it would have just been ineffective, you know, and just would have like it would have been neutralized by the other judge's opinion. Sorry, Carly, I think you were saying something. Yeah, I think it comes back to what we were talking about earlier with, with Gordon Stout encouraging Alice and all of his students to develop their own voice. Like, we all accept, you know, difference, differences in interpretations from our students, and we encourage that. And, and you know, for any one person, yeah, it, it's silly to think about. Like, of course, we want to please the the judge to, to so we get chosen or whatever, but um, it's it's impossible. So I think it's smart. I think that's exactly what you want to do. Just walk in and be you, and hopefully they love it. And, uh, you know, it, it actually, it's something I'm thinking about a lot. A couple of weeks ago, uh, where I was I was talking about goals, and one of the things I was talking about and I've been thinking about with my students a lot is we can't control the outcome of an audition or a competition. We can't control what the judge thinks. We can't control, you know, what the, the person judging the audition, what they're looking for. All we can do is control our preparation and to an extent control how it goes in the performance. You know, we always have surprises, um, but you can't, you can't try to guess what they're going to think and, and perform to that. You just have to, be yourself and fall back on all the decisions you already made. You know, Casey, I think it's a good time for a little history. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, I looked hard and not a lot happened on September 26, which is when we're going to be releasing this episode. So I did find one cool thing, though, and that is the premiere of West Side Story, the musical. So on September 26 in 1957, the famous West Side Story was premiered. So you have the musical by Leonard Bernstein when he was 38, words of Sondheim. And uh, of course, this is uh, the, the retelling of the famous Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet. And this opened in New York's Winter Garden Theater and it ran for 734 performances and a year long national tour and then 249 more performances on Broadway the last nine months of which the drummer was somebody special who we talked about recently. I bet Ben knows who it is. That was going to be, I was going to ask you that. <laughs> oh, you're gonna... <laughs> I know Carly knows. Let's, I know Carly knows also. Let's see. Alice, do you know who it was? The original drummer for West Side oh, Story? So no, I don't. Michael Colgrass. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's cool. I, I did not I did not remember that, but I do remember. I feel like I do remember you saying that. So that was really the only like big news thing I could find that happened on that September twenty sixth. I'm sure there are there are things and there are all sorts of premieres and performances and things, but that was the only one that really struck me. But um, yeah, I found uh, just some fun facts about West Side Story just while we're talking about it, and I pulled this from MentalFloss.com, which I'm sure probably pulled it from somewhere else as as these articles tend to go, but I'll just read from there. After the Staring Musical made its big Apple debut on September 26, 1957, critics reacted as if an atomic bomb had gone off over Manhattan. The next day, Walter Kern in the New York Herald Tribune wrote that the radioactive fallout for West Side Story must still be descending on Broadway. Theater goers were stunned. There was an edgy, electrifying show with some of the boldest choreography ever stayed, an emotional roller coaster from start to finish. So uh, pretty cool. And a couple of uh, lesser known facts you might not have known. And uh, I'll just read a couple of them. Some of them I, I didn't think were worth saying, but just a few from the article. 
this was originally going to be a story and a, a conflict about a Catholic boy and a Jewish girl rather than to uh, opposing street games. So this was something that they ultimately changed as they thought the like religious controversy was a little bit stale by now. So they went with something else and they didn't think it would be very, very controversial. They thought it was old news. And the Jets and Sharks were prohibited from interacting off stage. So the director, his last name is Robbins, tried to generate real hostility between these fictitious gangs. According to producer Hall Prince, the Broadway veteran kept both groups of actors far from e as far from each other as possible. They were not allowed to socialize in the theater. They weren't even allowed to take their lunch breaks together. And they say, obviously, this was an extreme approach, but over time, it started working, apparently. And it's funny. It reminded me of um, one of the actors from The Sopranos. And he was talking about a specific fight scene he had, the HBO series Sopranos. And I guess in this fight scene, which I don't remember, I have seen all the Sopranos, but I just didn't recall it so long ago, but they really fight. I mean, they really hit each other. They really, really get physical. And supposedly the director was saying like, you guys don't have to like go that hardcore. Like we can make this look real enough, but because they were such good friends, the two actors, they really were comfortable doing that. So I don't know. I mean, obviously, what the heck do I know? But uh, I thought it was an interesting choice. It seems like the counter would be better. Like, if you want people to be comfortable pretending to be hostile to each, each other, I feel like you actually need to have a whole, whole lot of comfort. But this is, I mean, this is like the famous West Side story. I would not know. Uh, what else? Uh, Four-letter words. So cuss words were replaced with unoffensive gibberish. So through West Side Story, lyricist Stephen Sondheim wanted the F-bomb to make its theater debut. Initially, this choice word appeared in the Officer, uh, G. Officer Krupke song, but Columbia Records, which released their original cast recording, noted that using such language would violate obscenity laws and hence prevent the show from touring across state lines. Defeated, they, defeated they went with, instead of fuck you, they said croup you, which is kind of the, the famous line and makes it uh much cuter than the real f word of course krupp krupp officer krupp key oh yeah krupp yeah yeah what did i say croup oh yeah yeah <laughs> i was thinking of, I was thinking of my son's cough a <laughs> croup <laughs> <laughs> cough which he doesn't have right now but he had <laughs> that's what i was thinking but yeah thank you yeah krupp key yeah of course krupp key and the last little one I found was that Maria originally had a death scene written. So like the Shakespeare play, the two star-crossed lovers kill themselves. And originally, uh, Maria was like also going to die. But apparently discussions, they said, no, like she's already dead inside. And it's you know more tragic if one of them is alive. So anyway, that's what happened on September 26th. And also just some fun West Side Story uh, trivia. So I I absolutely I love West Side Story and actually yeah. Carly, Carly can vouch for this. When I was a, a student at Miami, I did my secondary area in conducting, and I got to do a just one rehearsal, uh, a rehearsal of the uh, symphonic suite from West or symphonic dances from West Side Story. But one of the most fascinating things I discovered, and I love doing this, playing this in my music his, uh, music appreciation class. Do you guys know the the tune Cool Fugue from West Side Story? Da 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 da. That one. Yeah. Um, do you know what compositional device Leonard Bernstein used in it? Um, uh, cannon. I don't. Nope. It's a twelve tone row. Oh. I yeah, that, that. that famous little uh, melody is a twelve tone row. And so, in my music appreciation class, we do a little review of music history, and we get up to twelve tone music, and I play something by Schoenberg, and Nobody likes it, and that's fine. But then I play this other thing, and I say, so you guys like that one? And, you know, there's cool choreography choreography by Jerome Kern, and, you know, it's this, like, they're dance fighting, this awesome scene. And then I go, okay, well, that's also a total tone row. And I point out that's how he organized his material in that. Um, so, yeah, it's also a double fugue, um, as the name implies, cool fugue. But, yeah, it's I, I love West Side Story in that cool fugue is one of the the coolest things ever um no pun intended and then also uh carly and i uh, when we were students at miami we saw svet and gwen Deese perform a two piano two percussion version of it where there's basically a two piano version of it and they just sort of created two percussion parts based on the um uh orchestra version of it so yeah it's cool very cool so alice uh 
Ryu. I wanted to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to make sure that we have time to ask you about um, your studies over the summer with Keiko Abe, which I'm sure must have been quite the experience. What was that like? It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, so she gave lesson every Wednesday, and I literally cried every Wednesday because that was so touching by the thing that she told me. Um, it was. It was she's not only teach me music, she also teach me like a, a I don't know how to describe that, but it's a um a spirit rise thing. Like you feel your whole spirit is in a different level when you play with her. It's pretty pretty cool. Wow. We've had, we've had multiple people say that, like the, there's playing with Keiko Abe and then there are these things that are always outside. Like I know there's the the, the story she had her phone number for every student, and there was uh, an evening she'd set aside where she would sit by her phone at home, and she would say, "Any of you are welcome to call, but you have to. Act, you, we, we're not going to talk about music." Oh yeah, she, yeah. she, she. Um, other than teaching a lesson, she doesn't really talk about music that much, but she talks about a lot of um, like life experience, and she encouraged um, young musicians a lot. And for a big person like her, she will sit down with you and have have tea with you and order pizza, eating with you, and just talk about you know life things. It's, it's an ama- amazing um, experience in my life. Mm-hmm. What well, what did you? I mean, I, I I assume it was like a traditional lesson, like you you brought pieces to her, or did she? Like, did she evaluate your playing and then say, okay, I want you to play this piece of mine or that piece of mine? I mean, I think everyone goes to Keiko Abe. If you're going to go to Keiko Abe, it's to learn how to play Keiko Abe, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So her, her, uh, her lesson is like a master class every week. So she, she come into a school for three hours every Wednesday, and then you get to sign up lessons. Um, so sometimes you can choose not to play, but... Um, you know, I already paid for it. So I already, uh, um, I already have enough piece to play every week, and then um, you go and play for her, and there's a whole bunch of students sitting down there, and you can also see other students play, and she talks about it. And the cool thing is, when she, um, when I took lesson with her, she didn't really talk or teach that much, but she will just be like, "Hey, can I play with you?" And then while we play together, you can feel um, her energy is like getting you through the music. It's it's really cool. I have never had that kind of experience. Um, and being honest, before I um, before this summer, I think her music is cool, but it's a little bit. It's not deep enough. There's not too much of other artistic um, stuff in it. But after this summer, it's totally changed because all of the things she wrote, all of the things she decided to um, put in the music, mean something, and it's really cool. Can, can you can you describe for us why 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 it's important to play Keiko Abe, in your opinion? Yeah, I think first. Um, her music is plays an important role in the history of marimba repertoire. So, I, I do recommend all of my younger um, kids to play her music and learn how this developed. And um, another thing is, um, you have you heard about ma in Japanese? This is a concept of um, like a space pause and. Um, by learning her music, you can see a lot of ma in her music, and then um, this is this is the thing that's in their culture or in like Asia culture, and that's the thing that Western people usually um, don't really notice. But if you learn the music, uh, learn ma through her music, you can actually feel how the sections connect to each other and you can kind of um, feel the concept of Ma. And also her music is um, usually 
describing something. So it's easy for students to um, think about an interpretation based on the title or think about how the music mean um, to the life experience. If, any, if anyone's uh, interested in hearing more about this, Nani Mamura talked about it on an older episode and she gave a great class when I was in Italy with her and there's an episode of our podcast somewhere way back when with her, Theodore Milkov and um, um, Andrei Peshkarov were all just hanging out in a back room talking and I recorded them and I begged her to repeat some of her master class because I thought it was so profound in the way Alice is talking about like just this concept of uh, and, and it was a, it's a, a part of Bud Buddhism. She and I swear, I, I think she used the word ma because it has so much to do with space. And she talked a lot about Japanese traditional painting. And I thought it was just, yeah, very, very, very informative. To, and especially to think about your performer's relationship to the audience and artist's relationship to the audience and the performer. And uh, yeah, like a lot of a lot of cool utility there that you're right. Like we don't think about in in, in, uh, at least over here in the States, for sure. I, I actually developed a clinic project um, based on what I learned from her this summer and also through, um, I do a lot of Chinese painting. And so I, this clinic is about ma in music, but um, I use a lot of Asia painting to describe and to explain this concept to students. That's my new project. Very cool. What's what's some of your favorite? No, okay. We, we've asked many guests this before. Favorite Keiko Abe piece? You have to pick one. Ah, uh, it's really hard. <laughs> um, you have to pick. I think one. it's the when when the cross mountain. Uh huh. Mm. Yeah, I really like that one. It's so good to hear all of this about Keiko Abe and her music because I think sometimes like we hear especially some of these pieces so often that they start to lose the novelty or lose the effect but I think you're right what you're what you're hearing what you, what you're talking about Alice is going to make me hear everything in a new light and that's so so cool um Ben, I think you have something to share. Yeah, I, I just, I always have so many thoughts when it comes to Keiko Abe, and there have been so, so many wonderful comments about her on this podcast from uh, especially Robert Van Syce, Norm Weinberg, and who's the other one I just had in my mind? Um, I'm blanking out. I have, oh, uh, Mike Rosen, that's the other one. Um, and like, to kind of go back to Casey's question of like, what what can we get out of playing her instrument? It makes me think about how in the Steve Schick book, Steve Schick talks about... Um, we as percussionists, we don't have an instrument, right? Like BB King played Lucille. He didn't play guitar. He played Lucille. His guitar has one guitar. And yeah. so often as percussionists, we walk up and we play whatever xylophone happens to be there. And Keiko Abe, uh, Michael Rosen talks so much about how she has such a special relationship with the instrument. And it's, you know, even if she goes to a different Yamaha marimba each time, it's, it's, she has such a connection, a spiritual connection with that instrument. And I, I like a great like closing remark for Keiko Abe, I think, is from her PAS Hall of Fame uh, article. Uh, and it's just a little quote I love to go back to every single time I think about her. She says, I have great respect for the marimba. When I play, I have a great desire to find its expressive possibilities, knowing that at one time this most beautiful wood came from a living tree with its own history and experience. It is as if the marimba bar breathes like a living tree. And when I make music, I want to breathe with it. I think that's just so beautiful and profound. And then she just breaks every bar. <laughs> no. <laughs> she plays so strong. <laughs> that's, cool. oh, that's great. That's so beautiful. Well, Alice, I have, I have one more question for you, um, similar to the way that we're talking about the concept of Ma and Keiko Abe's um, music. I'm wondering if you can talk just a little bit about uh, I saw on your website a few pieces that you've written that were inspired by ancient Chinese stories. Can you talk about that influence in your own music? Yeah. Um, so all of this has come from, I have a cousin. Um, he's the, um, he's a Chinese opera singer. And it's really, he's really special because all of the role that he sings um, is girls. That he's a man. Um, 
So he really liked this kind of culture, and um, I started to listen to the music and go to the、um, Chinese opera with him. And I really like how the how their、um, body language on this on the stage. <laughs> Like the Chinese opera is very different from the Western opera.、Um, Western opera usually is very straight. If you open the door, you open the door. But in Chinese opera, when you open the door, it might take ten minutes for them to open the door. So that's really cool. But all the motion that they have are really pretty. So my first、um, piece that with the Chinese opera is.、Um, Based on a an ancient story about how a girl's like a guy, but she she、um, she's weak and about to die, so she can be with this guy. And this is a pretty story. And I wrote the percussion part, and he, my cousin,、um, act on that. And that was a really cool experience because I found out that I can actually bring this traditional. Art to people with this Western、um, new new music style to have people accept this art that's about to fade away. So then I wrote I wrote another one、um, that has a lot of fighting and rhythmic stuff. That's the one that's on my website. Mm-hmm. And then that's the one that has three movement, and、um, I actually bring that to Ithaca College, and we had a、um, percussion ensemble to perform it in、um, New York, which is really cool, and people liked it. So I I think this is a way for me to connect the Western my my Chinese background and Western education <laughs> together to people, and then bring this、um, new. Bring, well, I can't say new because it's old art. Bring this、um, stuff that's not a lot of people、uh, interested in anymore to、um, in a different way to let people accept. And you are from Taiwan, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. I, I, you mentioned my student Kai Po, and when you said bring Chinese culture to Western art music, Kai's done such a great job doing the same thing, like. When in percussion ensemble, he always wants to play Lou Harrison. He always wants to play John Cage. But every semester, he's got something from Taiwan or from from somewhere in China that I've never heard of and, and do not know. And it's well, I mean, so so much Asian influence in this in both Harrison and Cage. Anyway, that I know, right?、Yeah. Anyway, yeah, for sure, for sure. But I was I was going to ask, how do you know? Do you know how do you know Kai Po from from Taipei or or、uh, from? Ah.、Uh... I think we both were in the Ju Percussion Educational System. Yeah. So and also Taiwan is like this little, <laughs> and、right. there's this little percussionist there. So we、yeah. kind of know each other. Like we kind of know everyone. Okay, I sort of figured, but yeah, you said it said his name specifically. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. That's all. Yeah. Great. Well, Alice, that's really nice to to think about too. We've kind of had this running theme today, talking about finding your voice and what do you have to offer the world as a musician. And it's so great for you that that you're exposing people that might not know anything about Chinese opera to the, this art form. And it's it's special and unique and and just very cool that you're that you're doing that. So thank you. Thanks for sharing that with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, it's been so great chatting with you. Thank you very much for everything today. We've had a great time,、um, and we'll see you, see you hopefully at Pasic. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.